Welcome to Spindale United Methodist Church. To those of you who are attending the service via Facebook or YouTube, we are happy that you have decided to worship with us today. We invite you to visit us in person if proximity allows you to, or to visit our webpage, spindaleumc.org. You will find that we are a friendly, welcoming, non-judgmental church that prescribes to the philosophy of serving Christ through serving others. We have several announcements today. Uh, please note that the Western North Carolina Conference has revised COVID guidelines due to the increase in the Delta variant. We will be reinstating the use of masks in the sanctuary beginning today. Please remember to social distance with those outside your household. Thank you for helping us to keep everyone safe. Mark your calendars for a couple of upcoming events. There will be a kids bike rally committee meeting on Tuesday, August 3rd at 6 p.m. Uh, Paul has a little more to say about that. Paul? Uh, we will be meeting as a committee. We're gonna start our planning. We do have a date now and uh, I have a folder to keep up with things. But I wanna remind you and everybody out there online as well of the bike rally. We have a date of October the 30th for this year's bike rally. And like last time, we're going to have the Spindale Fire and Police Departments helping us. We've also got uh, a, another group, Rutherford Coalition, that wants to be a part of this. So we're planning on something as big or maybe even bigger than the bike rally of 2019. So uh, keep We'll keep you informed uh, of details as a as a uh, planning progresses, and uh, we look forward to that day sharing God's love in our community with our community. Thank you, Paul. Uh, other announcements include the blessing of the backpacks, which will be held on Sunday, August fifteenth. All children, teens, and adults are encouraged to bring their backpacks for a blessing. Uh, we are collecting school supplies for Spindell Elementary. The donation boxes are outside the church office. Suggested items are number two pencils, 24 count crayons, 12 count colored pencils, pencil top erasers, wide rule notebook paper, and zipper pencil pouches. Be sure to check your email for other announcements in, uh, by reading our weekly newsletter or the monthly newsletter, which uh, you can get uh, at the uh, website. Uh, please join me now for our invitation. Lord, we are grateful and blessed to be in your presence, not just for this service, but for all the time we allow you to be in our hearts and minds. We ask your blessings upon this service, upon those who cannot be here, whatever their reason, upon those who are with us remotely, upon our pastor, be with him as he brings us his message today and prepare us to receive it. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen.
Well, good morning. How you guys doing? Some shaking heads. Did you have a bad week? I'd like to call uh, Steve and Sherry Owens up front. We're blessed to have Steve and Sherry um, um, become members here at Spendo once again. Uh, they moved away for a while. I'm just going to talk for a while. I'll just say. Say, say thanks. Uh, we're happy to have you guys back as members here at Spindell Methodist Church. What a, what a blessing it is. You guys have been in a lot of different places, uh, South Carolina. You're still in South Carolina. Now, was it Georgia? Georgia? Name some of the places you, you, you all of. So what college football team do you pull for? whatever state you're in. That, what a diplomatic answer that was. That was wonderful. So it has nothing to do with what we're doing this morning, but I, I was just curious what, what team that would be. So what we're going to do is they're transferring their membership uh, back here to Spendo Methodist. Number one, we're blessed and we're excited about that. We're going to kind of renew the covenant um, that you have with, uh, uh, with what entails of being a member and also the congregation. You have a part in this as well as you'll renew your covenant with the Owen. So are you ready? Are you excited? A little bit? Okay. Let's do this. All right. Steve and Sherry, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you reject the spiritual forces of wickedness, the evil powers of this world, and the bondage of sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil and justice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you profess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? 
This is getting kind of intense, isn't it? Yeah. As a member of Christ Universal Church and as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Excellent. Now, congregation, if I can have your attention now, I'll ask you one simple question, and the answer is I will if you agree, and uh, if, if not, then you'll be escorted out and taken to another place. <laughs> Kidding. I ask you, Spindale Methodist Church, will you support both Steve and Sherry with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Amen. It was simple as that. We're excited to have you here. I'm going to say a prayer, and then we can formally welcome them into the, uh, to the fold again. So let's pray. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, uh, for your grace and your love and, and this church family. And we welcome Steve and Sherry back into the, they've always been part of the family, but now officially uh, back in the Spindale family. So we pray that all the things we just said, we, we pray that you're with them, that your grace is shining in their life that uh, this family is surrounding them with their prayers and their support, and we're just super excited. God, you are so good, so thank you so much for this, this moment. Thank you so much for Steve and Sherry as they become uh, members of the Spindale family once again. For us in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Can we? Thank you, guys. Well, I'm excited to be in part two of our sermon series called You Are What You Love. And what we've been doing during this series is it was kind of inspired by, well, it was definitely inspired by a book I read of the same name by uh, an author named James Smith, where he said that statement, essentially, we are what we love, meaning that what we do is often a clear indicator of the end result that we desire. And so from that, as individuals and as a corporate body in the church, it kind of begs the question, when it comes to the things we do in the church and in our personal lives as people of faith, what is the, the telos? What is the end desire that we're looking for from all of this? Is it just uh, stack them and pack them in the, in the pews? Is it, it, does it look like that? Is it just to pad the membership rolls? Is it to kind of put on a facade? I would dare say no to all those answers, but we have to ask ourselves, why do we do what we do inside this church, inside churches all together, inside the universal church, whatever? Now, as Smith points out in his book, many times in churches and in most everything we do as human beings, we are driven by our intellect or what we desire to know more of, or as philosopher Rene Descartes famously said, cogito ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am. But you know, interestingly enough, for Jesus, it was far less about what we know and far more about the condition and the motives of our hearts. In fact, for Jesus, the question, what do you want, is the question that is buried under almost every other question that he asks of us. For example, when Jesus asked his disciples, will you come and follow me? Or when he asked Peter, do you love me? In reality, they were just another version of what do you want? What is it that you want? In fact, as Smith suggests again, our wants and, and longings and desires are at the core of our identity. They are the wellspring from which our actions and behaviors flow. Therefore, as Smith suggests, discipleship is much more a matter of hungering and thirsting than it is of knowing and believing. You see, you are what you think is a motto that reduces human beings to being, a, being a merely a brain on a stick, really. I mean, if you think about it, even the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, he didn't say on that day my, my head was strangely warmed. Did he say that? He said what? He said, my heart was strangely warmed when I encountered Christ. You see, the truth is that it's very difficult for us to think our way into having a relationship with Christ. It, it very seldom, if ever, is that going to be the case. And so even though knowing things is not a bad thing, intelligence is not a bad thing, because we need to have a foundation for what we believe. We need to know why we, what we believe and why we believe it. 
But the truth is that our faith comes from a different place than our minds. In short, it comes from the transformation of our hearts, where we are at ease with showing the world the love that Christ has placed there. Now, if you're wondering why I'm wearing this really cool shirt today, there's a reason, there's a method to the madness of why I did that. This is Van Gogh. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, this art. But we, my wife and I had, uh, had a wonderful opportunity a couple weeks ago to go see um, uh, Van Gogh. And I'm not sure there was a lar larger name to all of that. But it was a, what it was is a display of Van Gogh's art uh, projected on a wall, and it was all animated. It came to life. It wasn't just a static picture on the wall of Van Gogh's uh, prints. And so we're sitting in this room, and there's a wonderful soundtrack playing, and these art pieces, many of which I know you're familiar with, some I didn't even know he did, were up there. But they're coming to life. If someone is, like, smoking a cigarette, the smoke is rolling, or the, the pain is going on the art, there's motion that's going on there. You see, what it was showing is not just the art, of Van Gogh, but it actually showed Van Gogh. It showed what he believed, where he came from, of almost like we talked about last week and we'll talk about more today, almost where Van Gogh had this belief, this faith like a child. It was the inner Van Gogh coming out projected on the walls, and it was a beautiful thing for us to see. Thus, during this series, our key verse is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 15, where we find Jesus sitting around talking with some children, he's praying with them, interacting with them, hanging out with them, and then some adults come up, bomb, 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 adult, it's always the adults, right? The adults come up and say, Jesus, what are you doing? Almost in an indignant way, are you kidding? You're wasting your time with the kids, to which Jesus had another zinger for them, and I loved how Jesus would throw these. Are you guys all right, by the way, this morning? Are you here? Okay, good, okay, all right. I had to ask that. This is what Jesus said. This is cool. He said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child, guess what? Will never enter it. Will never enter it. You see, for us, when, what Jesus was teaching in this passage was that, yes, you can be intellectual. That's not a bad thing. And yes, you should be mature. But at the same time, we should also believe in God and accept his kingdom, kingdom with the innocence and the faith of a little child child. Thus, with the question still lingering in the ether, what do you want, all wrapped in the paradigm of realizing that true faith comes from the heart, what I want to talk about today is how God helps us experience this heart transformation through God's presence. Or as a child might say, God is with me. Now, as many of you would more than likely agree, Presence really matters, right, especially to a child. Being present really matters. For example, if a child is alone in the house, many times when the house creaks or the dog barks or there's any kind of odd noise whatsoever, they may freak out, right? In fact, even though I'm not a child, at least not, not physically not a child, inside I, I question that a lot if I am a child, but the other night that kind of happened to me. I'll just confess this. I was, uh, I was, you know, I'm in the parsonage. It was late. Sabra had gone to bed before me. She had already, had already fallen asleep and snoring a little bit. She's not here this morning. She may watch it later. I'll get in trouble for that. But anyway, she was asleep. That's how I knew she was asleep. So I, I, I lay, lay down in the bed, and I'm just getting ready to fall asleep when I heard something. Now, we have a dog, and she's in her crate, and she moves around. And you can kind of hear the metal moving and stuff like that. But then I heard something else that sounded that like it wasn't the dog. And then I swore I heard somebody walking down the hallway. And then I, on top of that, I heard somebody right out our, beside our bedroom door. And this really, you know, I'm no panic merchant, but that freaked me out. I'm going to say that. So I, as brave as I am, I got up and turned all the lights on in the house, every, bit, every one of them. I looked in every single room, and I realized there's nobody here. The doors were locked, and if there was somebody here, they weren't human right? So I went back to bed and I cozied up real close to Sabre because I felt safe there next to my wife. But any, anyhow, back to the kids. The point is that if there's a grown-up physically present in the, in the house, like Sabra was for me, the child can take great comfort in knowing that they are safe because presence really matters to a child. Now to this point, I just love how Isaiah 41.10 frames this and assures us that God is 
with us. This is what Isaiah says. He says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, when we have childlike faith, we don't have to be afraid because God is always with us, and he's for us, and he's working in all things, all things, to bring about good. Now, to be quite honest, the problem that many of us experience is that even though we may be a committed disciple of Christ, we still may not believe, at least to some degree, that God is with us at all times. I mean, again, we may have this kind of intellectual, theological understanding of that God is everywhere. We get the old omnipresence kind of thing. But deep down in our core, we are at least suspicious that God is kind of an absentee parent in some th- sometimes in our life, especially when tragedy happens. You see, what we need to understand is that the manner in which God is with us now has actually kind of evolved over time because God is not static. God is always moving. God's always up to something. For example, in the Old Testament, when God said, I'm with you, what that really meant was God's spirit was with you. But then, like 2,000 years ago, this guy named Jesus was born on that Christmas day, what we call Christmas, what we celebrate in December, which wasn't technically his birthday, but that's okay. That's when we celebrate it. But when that happened, Jesus, in the form of God, as God, I should say, came here in the flesh and dwelt among us. Matter of fact, his name Emmanuel means God with us. And so if you tie that in with John 1, where it says, in the beginning there was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, well, then we'll know that God personally came here in the person of Jesus Christ and dwelt among all of us. Therefore, in this person of Jesus Christ, he wasn't just present with us spiritually, but along with that, he was actually physically present with us in the flesh. But it didn't stop there. You see, when Jesus gave his life on the cross and was raised from the dead, he said, hey, I'm going to send you my spirit as well, who will dwell with you. My spirit will be there with you until the end of the age. And so in short, no matter where we are, God will never, ever leave us. I don't know who needed to hear that this morning, hear it this morning or on Facebook Live, but God is there with you in all things. Therefore, when we have faith like a child and firmly believe that God is with us, well, then when the creeks and the chaos and the boogeymen of life come at us fast and furiously, well, then we can be assured that we are safely within God's reach and his presence. Okay, so as excited as you look this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how we can internalize the truth of God, which will help us transform, this is what we used to do in the former church, transform, this transformation that happens, and maybe even strangely warm our hearts at the same time as we enjoy God's presence in every aspect of our lives. Do you want to enjoy God's presence in every aspect of your lives? Thank you, you're here this morning, oh my goodness, I heard a heartbeat, All right, there we go. All right, so here are four very simple biblical truths that hopefully you can carry with you during the week. If you're at home, you know, maybe you have an advantage, you can jot these down, maybe you can write this on your spouse's hand or whatever, something, you write it down somewhere or just remember it. But they're important truths to take home with us. First of all, we talk to God. We talk to God. Now, if you're wondering why I didn't say pray to God, well, it's because I believe that the word prayer for a lot of people is a bit confusing and even intimidating. For example, when it comes to prayer, some people are like, I I don't even know how to pray. I I don't even know what to call God. Do we call him Heavenly Father, Almighty God, eight pounds, six ounce baby Jesus? What, What do I call him? And so because, a few of you got that, and so because we just know, we don't know, we we don't know what we don't know when it comes to prayer, praying out loud a lot of the time just kind of intimidates us, right? Now for me, when I was first I first became a disciple of Christ. We had these classes in the church at 101 through 501, and each class would kind of set up a different scenario in the church. And so I'm sitting in the 201 class, which is very similar to a life group, which I hope we get that going here soon, too. Anyone been in a life group before? 
not just a Bible study, a life group. Life groups are powerful. Actually, we have one, the whole back row can say this because our trivia night at, at the Daltons is a life group. I don't know if you guys knew that. That's a life group because we have conversations when we're there about God and important things and life in general. That is essentially a life group. So, but 201 kind of set us up for this. And so we're all sitting around in this circle, which is kind of intimidating in itself because you can't just like walk out of a circle because then everyone will see you. They're all facing you. So you can't like just fade into the mist and, and go away if you get scared. But what they were doing, the leader started out saying a prayer. And she said, what I want you to do is as it gets to you, I want you to add something to the prayer. And I'll, oh my goodness. I, I'm a new Christian, and I had no idea how to pray or anything holy. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't, all, and so I'm thinking, I'm just going to blow this. This is not going to be pretty. So I started trying to think of some things that were fam familiar to me. And as the chain got closer to me, I'm starting to sweat, and I'm just really nervous. I, I think I, I might have cried a little bit. It was just a bad day for me. So I was like, God, please help me not sound like a dork. And I'm serious. I'm being very serious. And it got to me, and I was like, okay, what is it that you can say from memory of being in church as a kid? And I was like, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Lord, forgive me of my trespasses, and I forgive others of theirs. That's a pretty good start, right? But then I went blank. And the only thing I could think of was song lyrics, because I know songs. And they're all secular songs. So I'm going, uh, uh, Lord, forgive us, we are two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl <laughs> year after year. Amen. And, I, and I, I ended it right there. Now, if you don't know, let me just say this. Nothing says, God, I know you're with me, and I'm in this quite like spewing forth the words to wish you were here by Pink Floyd, okay? And, and that's a true story. That happened to me, and I, I, I still get razzed to this day about the Pink Floyd. I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan, so that actually was natural to me. And so what I want to do today is just encourage you to make your conversation with God as simple as you can and just talk to him. There is an otherness to God. There's no denying that. And God is God and we're not God. But God is all about the conversation, not about the prayer. You don't have to wear a pointy hat and swing incense for God to listen to you. Just stop and talk to God. Matter of fact, Paul said pray without ceasing, which means we're communicating with God with, and with everything that we do. And, and I say that because I can assure you that God already knows. God already knows that you're not Billy Graham or or the Pope, or Beth Moore, or a member of Pink Floyd. God doesn't care about that stuff. God just cares about you, cares about your heart. It's not a mind thing, it's a heart thing. Now, I love the way that David prayed in Psalm chapter 54, verse 2. And this is what he said. He says, hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. You see, what I've learned along the way is that I actually pray way more consistently and way more authentically by just having an ongoing conversation with God all throughout the day. I mean, it might be something like, God, what do you want me to do about this? Or God, I need strength. I can't do this by myself. I need your presence. God, thank you for the opportunity to have this lunch with this person or this conversation with this person or do whatever. Thank you for putting me in the situation that I'm in right now. Please show me what to do next. And so in short, it's just this ongoing dialogue with God where we just simply talk with God and solicit his wisdom and his peace in all things. In fact, this is how Paul put it in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He said, and this is very familiar, but it's powerful. I mean, just take this home with you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so what should we pray about? Well, everything, right? You pray about your geometry exam if you're still in school. You pray about your lost hamster. You pray about your marriage. You pray about your job, your school, your health, your church, your pastor. All things, all things you pray for to God. And so we just pray, 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 and know that in all the good stuff, bad stuff, regular stuff, irregular stuff, God is always with us, okay? Okay, so the second way we connect with God um, 
who is with us is simply to listen to God. Listen to God. This is what Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 20 says. It says, listen to God's voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. Do you believe that, that the Lord is your life? Yes. Amen? I hear some amens and some, like, a little bit of clapper and stuff like that. Don't, it's all good. It's all good. You know, I know a lot of Christ followers, including me, who might say that, you know what, I've never heard the audible voice of God. Has anyone ever heard the audible voice of God? Have you? That's amazing. I want to talk to you about that more later. I've never heard the audible voice of God, but God is God. So God can speak in so many different ways to so many different people. And, I, and, and I've been listening for an audible voice, haven't quite yet. So wait, we've got, I want to talk to both of y'all after, after the service about that. What's that? Oh, we'll get to, we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> but God can speak in so many different ways. You see, I believe that God can still speak to us again audibly if God so desires. But because God's God and God can do whatever he wants, God can also communicate with us. Uh, in so many other ways, and so we have to listen, and we have to pay attention. And so how does God speak to us? Well, unquestionably, the best and most reliable way to hear God's voice is when we read the Bible, when we read the Word, especially if we're, and, and, and I'm kind of going against what I said earlier a little bit, but you kind of have to know what you're reading. You have to put it in context, because the Bible can also be used as a weapon, Right? If we don't know what we're reading in this proper context and the, in, in, in the language in which it was written, those kind of things. But we can definitely hear God's voice through his word, the Bible. For example, I can't tell you how many times, and I bet many of you here would say the same thing. I can't tell you how many times I've been preparing for a sermon or just doing my daily devotion where I've read the same passage again over and over, and I get something different than I did the last time. Has, is anyone else like that besides me? Yeah. I mean, God speaks the word is alive, and God will speak through his word. Now, another way God can communicate with us is through other people. And I, and I, and I think that's what David was saying there with, with Jane, that Jane speaks to you, and, and she is the voice of God. Was that sarcasm? or yeah, it was sar Okay, all right. I, I don't know if I believe that sarcasm. I think God will speak to any of us, even someone like, someone like me. Now, I said this before. But during the community meals and the homebound visits, driveway trivia, meetings, golf outings, et cetera, lunches, all that stuff, there's no denying that they in and of themselves are great, right? I mean, they're, they're a wonderful time that we, we're together serving God or, or in these situations. But for me, it's always the dialogue that we have. I've had a great time hanging out with the youth works kids back here. And I won't call you kids because you're in your 20s, so you're not kids anymore. Um, but just hanging out and, and, and just having conversations. Uh, 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 Jacob and I almost went to blows at lunch one day because theologically we're on different sides of the fence. I'm just kidding because I would have taken you, man. But we, it, that's what I enjoy most of all. Most of any, uh, in all these things, what we, what we get from that dialogue cannot be overstated or, or it should not be undervalued. That's how God speaks to us. And a lot of time through this dialogue that moves us and motivates us and encourages us even. You see, we have no idea how the things we say, the encouragement that we give to other people, how that's going to affect them down the road. It may be something that you said that, that was silly. You thought was silly. You thought meant nothing, but it meant the world to that person you were talking to. Or it's that text you sent or that email or the phone call. Those kind of conversations in the hallway, whatever they might be. That person needed to hear that because God was trying to speak through you, through your life. That's why when we don't do those things, that's why we have this sense of guilt that kind of happens. Like, you know what? I blew that. I have that almost every day because I feel like I miss it quite often, what God wants me to do in situations. But that's what God is saying is that, eh, you might have kind of missed that one. Uh, you know, keep your eyes open as, as I, I, I point you into the right direction to have these kind of conversations. Now, God can also speak to us through a song, through a message, through our circumstances, and through God's Holy Spirit, who prompts us and guides us and corrects us and even gives us clues as to when someone might need prayer or a kind word. You see, the longer we walk with God and the more we realize that God is with us, well then, the more we won't just talk to God, but along with that, we'll also be able to hear God, what God is saying. A lot of us think, maybe, that prayer is all about you saying something. 
all about you praying and saying these wonderful things again, like the Pink Floyd lyrics I was talking about earlier. But it's not. Prayer is listening to God, listening to God's Holy Spirit as God's Holy Spirit moves you and directs you. This is what Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21 says. It says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the, the way, walk in it. I told you Aerosmith was a holy man, right? Walk this way, you hear? That's where they got this from, right, right here. Anyone know who? Never mind, okay. <laughs> okay, so we talk to God, we listen to God, and then third, we also receive from God. We receive from God. Now, the problem for many of us as adults is that we don't know how to receive from God, do we? we? We're not good at that. In fact, to be quite honest, many of us don't even know how to receive from other people. I mean, some of us, including me, can be so turned around about, uh, about receiving help. We want to help others, but when someone tries to help us, we're like, oh, no, no, I've got this. I've got this. And we won't take that help on that when people want to, want to help us. But on the flip of that, when it comes to a little child, well, they are very gifted in the fine art of receiving, aren't they? I mean, if you've been around children, you know they love it. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but have you ever heard a, ki a kid say, no, 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 really, that's too many presents? Now, save that for someone else. I, I have plenty. I have plenty of toys. I have plenty of this. I'm good. No, never. You've, no, you've never heard that. In truth, I can honestly say with, a, say with a clear conscience that I have never either heard a kid say that. And so if that's true, what does a child say? Well, they say things like, bring them on, baby, line them up, stack them and pack them. I can, I can take some more. I have more room. And so in turn, and in, in reality, a, a kid knows how to receive. You see, when we have faith in God like a child, well, then we learn to receive from God like a child. And from that, we learn to accept God's gifts and God's wisdom. You see how important that is, I hope. Now, what kinds of things can we receive from God's presence? Well, even though this list is not exhaustive, here's a short list. First, God's presence gives us courage when we're afraid. And it gives us strength when we're weak. And it gives us rest when we're weary. And it also gives us comfort when we're in pain, which is kind of the point I want to hang on here just for a minute. You see, there are so many people I know and love dearly who are really hurting in this present season in some way or another. They'll never tell you. They may not tell you because, you know, they have to put on this, this facade. But inside, they are just a wreck. With this, for those people, I would say this. I, I hope you get this and take this away. If nothing else I'll say today, God loves you and God understands. God's heart's breaking more than your heart for whatever your situation is. And God is with you. This church family is with you. I've said that a number of times. This is, uh, I, I would say this is probably, and I, if, if my other churches are listening now, just turn off right now. I'm getting ready to say this. This may be the most loving church I've ever been in because the way you guys love each other. It makes my job very easy in, in, in what I do and what I bring to the table. But you guys are all over it. But know that your church family is, is with you. They're there for you. And God is with you in all things. So if you're going through something right now, don't keep it to yourself. Let God help you. Let your church family help. Let us talk with you and pray for you, help you in whatever way that you may need that we can offer. This is what 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. You see, honestly, it doesn't matter what you're going through right now, if it's a trial, a struggle, a pandemic, or a misfortune of some kind. If you give it to God, who is with you in all things, it can and will be met head on. And this is what Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13 says. And I love this metaphor. It speaks volumes to the nature of God. It says, as a mother comforts her child, so I, God, will comfort you. Dad, you know what I'm saying here. It's nothing like a mom's hug. Dad, we, you know, we, we dads try, but it is not the same thing as mother. God takes on that role, the same kind of hug and love and comfort that a mother gives. I am winding down. I can tell you're weary. I'm getting there, making strides towards that finish line here. 
And so we talk to God, and we listen to God, and we receive from God. And then fourth, we enjoy God's presence. Can you imagine that? We can enjoy the otherness of God. We enjoy God's goodness, and we enjoy God's presence. Now, I think we would all agree that it's more fun and to, en to enjoy something we love when we're with someone we love, right? It's just more enjoyable. And so since we love God, wouldn't it just make sense and be a, a groovy kind of thing if we spent some quality time with God too? Don't you think God wants to be a part of that? For example, let's say you're driving to work or you're walking the rail trail in the morning with some friends. And then all of a sudden, bam, you see this beautiful sunrise going up. And you think, wow, God you did that. Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked at creation and say, God did this? Have you ever thought about that? Well, maybe that's your situation where you're just going through and it hits you like a fist to the forehead. And you're like, wow, my God created that. It's because of God that I'm looking at this. And then suddenly we're locked into that moment with God and we find ourselves enjoying his presence in the sunrise that God created. Or we, perhaps we find ourselves in a ministry moment and we think, God, I believe that this person needs something. The one that's right in front of me, the one that you put there, they need something. What do you want me to say to them? And then you're scrambling around like I was during that prayer and you're trying to think of something to say and then God just makes it very simple. And God says, just be there. I may give you something to say, I may not give you something to say, but I'll give the ability to be in front of them and to be with them and to love them, and to nurture them in that situation. And then God gives us that opportunity or that blessing to do that. Or let's say we come to church one day and we're like, I'm tired. Pastor Eric won't stop talking. God, I need you. Please make him stop. Okay? And then God shows up in a song or maybe by something accidentally I'm saying that you watch on Facebook Live later, like, hey, that was pretty decent, what, what was said right there, but I was way too tired in the moment to hear it. Or God shows up in a hug. You know, we're in COVID now, folks, and I get it. I mean, there's like the fist pumps, and we got to the handshakes a little bit, and the hugs sometimes, but I guess we're back in quarantine again, and all, oh, my goodness gracious, there's nothing like quite like a hug. You know, sometimes people come to church, and that's the only hug they get ever during the week. This is the only time where people can love on them and, you know, in, in God's name in a place like this. And when that happens, we can say, man, I needed that. And so in short, because God loves to hang out with us, um, doesn't it just make good sense for us to take pause and enjoy our life with God and not just go through the precious moments of our life robotically and alone without allowing God to expand our vision in our hearts. Isn't that the purpose? I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have arrived. I don't know how many of you know all things that are of God, the otherness of God, the ethereal stuff that's floating around. How much of that do you know? How much do you think you know? But I can assure you of one thing. You don't know it all. You might think you do, but God will surprise you today, tomorrow, at some point in time, if you let God surprise you. In fact, this is what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, this is what he said in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 30. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his, God's, presence. Now as we close, I'll say that one more time. We're going to close now, okay? You guys okay with that? Don't answer that. I don't want you to miss, I heard an amen. Please don't miss the power in this landing. Let's land the plane in, in this way. You see, if we can have a moment with God where we truly, re truly realize that God is with me, well, just try to imagine how that can escalate. If you have one moment with God where you realize God really is with me. I mean, if we intentionally spend a minute with God, well, guess what? That can turn into an hour. An hour can turn into a day. And a day can turn into a month. And a month can turn into a year. And before you know it, you've spent your entire life enjoying the presence of God, talking to God, allowing God to give you things, uh, giving things back to God. This whole relational thing with God will happen just from starting. You know how races are won in the Olympics? They start. 
and they're gone. They take off. How many of, are sit of us are sitting right where we are, and we're in the same place we were last year, or last month, or yesterday, whatever? How many of us are right where we think we need to be and not allowing God to make a difference in our lives? I can say I'm far more guilty of that than I, I would like to admit. And so, I am closing now. We must have faith like a child. It starts with that. And we allow God to expand our hearts artistically like Van Gogh, where our lives, the things we do, the things we hold precious, they aren't static. They aren't projections on a wall that are static, but they're moving. There's some motion in our lives. We're helping people. We're talking with God. We're studying God's word. We're loving everybody, right? And from that, our vision becomes more broad. We see through eyes through a different pair of glasses like maybe God would see someone. We see someone that normally we wouldn't like, that we would avoid, that we stay in the situation. And though I know the scripture doesn't say you have to like everyone, you're supposed to love everyone, but you don't have to like everyone, I get that. But God does call us to love everyone. God does call us to wherever we are, be there. And when we get this, then our life and our faith becomes less robotic and obligatory where we have to do this stuff, and more of a joy and full of purpose in the here and now. Isn't that kind of the point of it all? Will you pray with me? Most Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ, and, and the words you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to communicate with you through um, just common language. Not the, not the, it doesn't have to be the fancy stuff. It doesn't have to be the heavy $50 theological words. You just want to know who we are. You want our, our hearts. You want for there to be transformation inside of us. And Lord, we cannot do that if we walk around and we're so adult, you know, so static in, in the way we see things and do things that you can't move in our lives. So I pray as we understand and we're unpacking this, what exactly is it? that we want and that we are what we love, that we understand these are very important questions to not only our individual faith but also for the church because it, it denotes why we're doing the things we're doing privately and corporately as a church. So Lord, I pray that that's what we're talking to you about. Lord, what is this all about? What am I doing? Show me, show me the things I should be doing at, at the present time. It's not about going to heaven. It's about in the here and now in the kingdom of God. Heaven's a, a benefit on the other side of life. So I pray we're here and we're now and the kingdom of God is the focus and that we're loving all the people that you put right in front of us. For us in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
I say this every time, but you know, I repeat myself. This is just the way it is, but I love communion. I love this meal. I love what it symbolizes. I love the way Jesus presented this to his friends. I also want to say this before we get into that uh, too far. I, I applaud you for those of you who have moved forward. I, I felt like for the longest time you thought I was Gallagher and I was going to smash a watermelon on you or something, so you went closer to the back. It's okay wherever you sit, but I feel like, you know, there's, there's, there's something, there's a chasm between us. So I, I appreciate the moving forward just a little bit. I'm not sure why I said that. I felt like I needed to. But with that in mind, with that in mind, that is, that really does point to what communion is. Because if we look at the very nature of what it was, it was Jesus sitting around a campfire with his friends, having a conversation goofing off, probably taking a pontoon boat out on the lake, having conversation over Mexican food, do, doing things like that. We look at Scripture and we think of Jesus as, you know, just being this, this person, being God, but God was flesh and blood, or Jesus was flesh and blood and was God at the same time. And that's really what Jesus was saying by inviting his disciples around this table. By the way, and I love that Youth Works did this on Thursday nights, they, they had feet washing. And which was a, a, a symbolic during this time, too, because that's what Jesus did with his disciples before they share this meal. You see, it's very much humbling ourselves and serving others. That is at the breadth, uh, the core of what communion actually is. So as you take communion today, and we're back on the cups, if you don't have a cup, please uh, raise your hand and we'll, we'll get one to you if you, if you desire to have one. And uh, Bill will bring that to you. But I want you to remember that as we're doing this today, that, yeah, it is symbolism for what happened 2,000 years ago, but as being part of God's family now, it's much more than that. This bread and this wine comes alive. It comes alive in that our acceptance of who Jesus Christ is in us comes alive. And once we accept that and live through that paradigm, it changes a lot of things. On the night of his betrayal... Jesus took the bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his best friends and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup of the vine, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his best friends and said, brothers, take this, this is the blood of the new covenant, do this as often as you drink it. Sorry about that. Mara's going to be mad at me now. The body of Christ is broken for you. And it's the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Mara, I made a mess. I'm totally human. That's a preacher bloop, blooper there is what that is. I'd like to call uh, our friends from the Youth Works um, up here now. As, uh, as many of you know, these have been the leaders of a lot of kids from a lot of places around the, the country, and they have led them in community service. They've led them in devotions. They've shown them the ways. They have been apprentices in many ways of a lot of young lives who will be affected directly for a long, long time. I don't know if they really understand the impact of what they've done this summer. And they may have done this before in different forms or shapes and forms, but I, I would dare say you know, just interacting with some that you have talked to and that you've led, that the impact is great. It's amazing. Uh, Jacob says something about me, and, and he can't quite figure me out because he doesn't know when I'm kidding or when I'm serious. I'm being very serious right now, Jacob. I am. I don't know if you know that or not. I'm being very serious. I love you guys. I'm going to miss you. We're going to miss the energy and the passion, the drive, the service that you all brought to this community of the Rutherford County, and we thank you. Let's give them a round of applause now. 
we really indebted to this. This will be something that we'll treasure forever. We hope we're, uh, I, I, and I'm assuming you won't be the same crew coming back next year because I know you're, you have different stages in your life that you'll be going to. But I can assure you whatever, whatever ministry that, that uh, these fine young adults find themselves in, God will bless that because they've got it. And, and I take that back. I'm busting Jacob's chops about the theological. He has a strong theological grounding. He really does. Matter of fact, on the way back, now we were having a conversation, and here he knows what I'm getting ready to say. We were talking about something heavy. I don't know what it was. And we get down to almost turning into the church. And, we, we, you know, and that aside, and then, uh, and then Hunter asked me, uh, well, what do you think of prophecy? And I have like 10 seconds to talk about it. And I was like, well, we can't even do that. that that's to be continued. But that's kind of the nature of the conversations we've had. It wasn't just topical stuff. It was, I mean, some of it was, but a lot of it was of holy things. And so, folks, these, these are the real, these, these young adults are the real deal, and we really do celebrate you. And we want to send you off with a prayer today. So I know with the whole COVID thing, I was going to ask everyone to come up, but just raise your hand. We'd like to, the laying of hands is what we do now is we'll pray for them going forward. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, what you've done through Youth Works. Uh, they have been a blessing to so many people that they have affected as leaders, but they've also been a, um, an, an amazing, an amazing part of this church for a couple of months and this community just by their service and their passion and their attitudes and all they bring, the energy they bring here. So I pray as you have worked in their lives here now, as you've moved and made things happen through them now, that as they step out into the world, as they're leaving us now, that you'll be right there with them, that your presence, as we talked about today, will be with them, and you'll do great things through them in the future as you have done now in the present here in Spindale. So thank you, Lord. We see them as a blessing here at Spindale Methodist because they have blessed our lives immeasurably. So we thank you. We ask for your blessings for them moving forward. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. You all are dismissed.